Well, it's 10 o'clock, so um, let's get started. I'm gonna put on my screen share right now. And let's get this view. Let's go to the beginning. Everybody can see okay? Yep. All right, so I wanted to do something a little bit different uh, today and um, talk about landslides. This is the season for them uh, because of all the rain that we get, although I don't know what's going on out in the world right now. <laughs> uh, but this is the time that we do see a lot of slippage in the area. And uh, this is actually Alberon um, Avenue. And I got the uh, luxury of watching this thing come down one day. Uh, which was, in my mind, a ton of fun. Um, I, I am a natural hazards buff. I love landslides in particular. Um, I, I don't want anyone to get hurt or property to be damaged, of course, but I, I do love the power and dynamic nature of the earth. And this is kind of where, in the natural disasters world, um, that really shines through. So I was very lucky to move to Cincinnati because. Um, Little did I know that this was a landslide mecca, and uh, and from a geological perspective, that uh, that makes me very happy. Also, we tend to think that geology and the processes that shape our landscapes uh, happen elsewhere or happen a long time ago. Uh, we live in a world where we uh, everything is pretty stable. We do our daily routines. We go to and from work. We kind of forget that we live on this dynamic planet and every once in a while uh, we're reminded of that and landslides are a wonderful way to kind of kick us out of that um, static view of the world and rem remind us, oh my goodness, things are actually happening and geology is actually happening and the earth is still shaping the landscape around us whether we are on it or not uh, and oftentimes we are in the way. And sometimes we even help it out a little bit. So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, um, landslides. And in order to do that, we really have to go all the way back, really far back in time to about 450 million years ago. And so if I can, there we go. Um, and we're going to deal with two sort of time periods, primarily. We're gonna deal with our local Ordovician rock, which is late Ordovician about 450 million years ago. That really forms the bedrock that we have here in the Cincinnati area and pretty much forms most of the hillsides that you see in this region that slip. And then we're also gonna go into the Quaternary, into the Pleistocene, back about two million years really, uh, maybe a little more to, uh, figure out what processes happened there that help facilitate uh, landslides. So that's really looking at the geologic history of the surface area rocks and processes that have happened um, in the Cincinnati region. And in order to do that, we sort of need to go way back in Earth's paleogeography, looking um, 450 million years ago at what the planet looked like back then. Um, as you can see, it's very different from today, but we know, thanks to plate, the theory of plate tectonics, that continental uh, pieces and oceanic confi uh, oceans change configuration through time. Um, and that is a constant, constant um, process that we were reminded of through natural disasters like volcanoes. Right here on the red star. So we're about 20 degrees south of the equator. Uh, you'll see that North America is uh, tilted on its side and that most of the United States is actually underwater. Um, just for reference, we have a couple of other major continents. Uh, Siberia is our closest neighbor. Baltica, which is uh, the northern Europe, Baltic states like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, is over here. Uh, New England and Nova Scotia have yet to attach to the eastern seaboard of what will become North America. Uh, at this point in time, we don't refer to it as North America because it isn't recognizable as the continent we currently live on. Um, its proto-North American name, if you will, is Laurentia. So we still have a lot of continental accretion. We still have a lot to build before we get to North America that we recognize. 
Um, and then we have this mega continent called Gondwana, which is a common theme uh, throughout Earth's history. It's, it's generally a southern hemisphere continent. And I like to think of it as, as um, including all the A's. So Antarctica, Africa, South America, and so forth. Uh, we add India, we can add a little bit of um, Madagascar in there, Australia is uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere, strange. And, uh, and that's sort of a mega continent that gives us um, a lot of ice ages sort of throughout um, Earth's history. So the reason why I bring this up is because in order to understand our history of landslides, we kind of need to understand where and how the processes of the rocks we have come from. And so the Taconic orogeny, about, starting at about 470 million years ago, uh, culminating at about 450, was really a, um, an accretion event where a volcanic island arc system, kind of similar to a modern day Japan, welded itself to the eastern margin of the United States, creating what's known as the Taconic orogeny or the Taconic Mountains. Uh, this is the basement rocks of our lovely Appalachian mountain range. So everywhere you can think of sort of the Appalachian, the, the beginning of the formation of the Appalachians, which is actually a multi-phase collision. Here's phase two coming on up. So these highlands, these mountains were created um, to the east of us. Here we are located here. And because uh, there was really little to no life on land, at this time in Earth's history, they were exposed a lot to weathering. And the weathering rates of these mountains is incredibly fast. And as the granite is weathered by rain and, and um, wind and so forth, it's uh, chemically changed uh, and weathered, broke it, chemically weathered down to form clay particles. And those muds that form the clays were transported to our region through the action of very, very large hurricanes and storms. And as it did this, it would basically transport in these underwater gravity flows, these deposits known as tempestites, which of course refer to tempestuous or stormy. So uh, geologists refer to the Cincinnati area and our deposits as a storm dominated ramp. It's a shallow, uh, shallowly dipping, gently dipping ramp that um, has a lot of wave action in the shallower ends uh, due to those storms. And then the winnowing of that mud, the removal of that mud in these dense gravity flows transports that mud down slope, um, burying anything in its path that um, is alive or already dead and uh, creating the shales uh, and mudstones that we have in the Cincinnati region. So when you look at outcrops, either in creek section, like this is rapid run, um, or in, uh, in road cut section, this is along the AA highway, um, you can see that all of this mud really comes from the breakdown of those uh, taconic mountains, the granites that form that mountain, those mountains, and a shed down into our region through the action of uh, hurricane and other storm waves as well. And you can see that there's a lot of clay, a lot of mud in here. Uh, we think uh, sort of the, the way that we commonly refer to it as shale, it's actually a mud stone technically, um, but the cope formation, which is the beds that predominantly lie around the Cincinnati area that really are sort of troublesome for us in terms of landslide, landslides, um, really are very mud rich. So we have about 75% mudstone or shales. And then we have these benches of limestone that are the accumulation of these shells and other debris, sometimes a little bit of mud coming from the winnowing of those storm waves as they concentrate debris in the shallower portions of um, the ramp. And so you can kind of see we have these alternating bands, which tell geologists a lot about the climate history and storm intensity um, of the region 450 uh, million years ago. It also gives us a little bit of an idea of how deep the ocean was at this time and also helps us to understand the kinds of animals that we have preserved in these layers. But that's for another story. We're going to continue on talking about the mudstones and the shales and why they matter so much to our uh, landslide history. 
And the reason they do is because clay minerals form what's referred to as an inherently weak material. Um, clays are very absorbent and they're also polarized. They attract water, so they're hydrophilic, meaning that they attract water as opposed to being hydrophobic, which repels water. And when clays get wet, water molecules attach and separate the clay minerals apart, kind of like getting the pages of a book wet. So you can uh, imagine here in this uh, high uh, scanning electron microscope view of clay minerals, they look like little pages in a book. And if you were to put water molecules in between them, they kind of would flail out, kind of like how wet pages in a book uh, do when they, um, after being soaked. And what this does is it, it does two things. It spreads the grains apart. So it reduces the friction between the grains that, that is needed to hold everything together. And it also expands them. Oh, excuse me. It also expands them. So what was a small amount of clay all of a sudden becomes a much bigger amount of clay. And, and you probably experienced this just by uh, you know, walking around in creek beds or on slopes and hill cuts in this area, maybe even in your garden, we have very clayey soil. Um, and so the fact that it naturally absorbs water and spreads the grains apart, reducing friction, means that the material itself under weathering conditions is actually really weak. And so in areas where we have exposures on hillsides that are exposed to rain and snow and ice and wind and so forth, uh, upper surface layers can uh, essentially fall off and become very weak. And when you think about the fact that we're kind of building on that, um, our houses and our infrastructure and our roads, uh, you can begin to see where some of the problems might lie. If you were to dig into the hillsides about six feet or so, maybe even a little less. Anywhere where the shales are not exposed directly to weathering, uh, it becomes a really hard mudstone. Uh, that is pretty solid stuff. And we can build our buildings on bedrock. Uh, in fact, many of our mitigation measures are anchored in the same bedrock. It just has to be not exposed to the vagaries of weathering in order for it to be solid and a good foundation to build on. So because of our geologic history and the Ordovician and the ocean that was here, we have this naturally weak material that's exposed at the surface. And it's exposed at the surface because of our Pleistocene Ice Age history. And that is that we've had many incursions, uh, we think at least three, possibly four, although we only have evidence of three here, um, of ice sheets into our region that have essentially carved our landscape. And so uh, these ice sheets have basically changed and are responsible for all of the drainage that we see sort of in the Cincinnati region. So the beautiful hillsides that we enjoy, this is the Ohio River, plus the hillsides that we see along the Little Miami and the Great Miami Rivers. This is the Mill Creek coming up through here and an old deep stage cut going across Hamilton that joined the Mill Creek and the Great Miami uh, in our past. It's kind of fun to see that there. Uh, all these river valleys have these beautiful hills that we build on. And what they do is they cut these slopes into this inherently weak material that forms our bedrock. And so our geology kind of gives us a double whammy in that regard. In addition, we also have these beautiful lake clays. Uh, so as glaciers come through, um, they pool water and create these beautiful lakes. And the clays that form in these lakes are incredibly fine grained and uniform. And so they're some of the most beautiful clays. In fact, people use them in this area for uh, pottery. But this very fine scale lamination and fine clays, like we saw before, um, are an inherently weak material as well. So we also have clays deposited in the region from our glacial past. And I don't have time to go through sort of that whole process, but um, we do have a very um, important glacial history here. Um, and that has also led to the deposition of 
inherently weak materials in our area, particularly along the Mill Creek. Here's a, a picture along I-75. I'm sure you guys have seen this or examples of it where there's slippage in um, these lake clays as well, and also along the valley roads. So, so what happens when you take these weak clays and you expose them through cutting, either naturally through the natural glacial slopes that we have in this area, or in this case, man-made when we build roads and so forth, is that you expose that inherently weak material that was once underneath the surface and stable to an unstable condition. And this creates a layer of sediment on top of it called colluvium. Colluvium is really just the weathered byproducts of the landscape that you're seeing here. It's clay rich in our area. It often contains um, organic material like trees and so forth. It mantles surfaces and can be down um, to, to depths greater than six feet. And it creates this sort of very loose sediment mud on top of these slopes that is sort of hanging on. It's kind of like waiting to go. And the problem is, is that many of the hillsides that we've cut in this area are greater than the angle of repose. So the angle of repose is the steepest angle at which any material is really stable. You can kind of think of um, making sand castles at the beach and filling your bucket with sand and then dumping it over and seeing the pyramid that it forms. That angle on the side of that pyramid is the angle of repose for that material. And the angle of repose is higher, that is it can form higher slopes, the more coarse the material is. And to a certain point, if you add a little bit of water, you can get higher slopes. But if you add too much water, it saturates it and then it fails. And so in our area with clay, we only have an angle of repose of about 15 degrees. And unfortunately, a lot of our hillsides that we cut are greater than that. In fact, some of them are 90 degrees uh, to the horizontal. And that is beyond the ability for material to hang on. So as that colluvium accumulates over time and it's on a steep slope, it's eventually going to fail. And that's kind of the most common type of landslide uh, that we have in this region. And by the way, it's really what you're seeing happening along Columbia Parkway. Um, and what they're doing there is they're scraping in order to get rid of the colluvium and they're scraping it down to bedrock. It's taken about 80 to 90 years for that colluvium to build up um, because that section of Columbia Parkway was redone in the 30s. And so we know that, you know, the amount of landslides that we have in that, in, along that strip are only actually going to get worse if we don't remove the colluvium because of the amount of time that it's taken to build those sediments up. So we have our geologic history of inherently weak materials. We've cut some, some deep, steep slopes into that material naturally through glacial carving as, as um, ice sheets came into this region. But we also have done our own fair share of damage. Um, you know, long before we sort of knew all of this engineering stuff and the impacts of it, uh, Cincinnati was doing a lot of things that exaggerate um, landslides or mass movements. Things like, here's the, here's the building of Columbia Parkway where you cut the hill on one side and then you fill it on the other. This is cut fill practice is a is a common practice, particularly with roadways and even subdivisions, where you want to make more usable area, um, surface area for your purposes, whether it's a road or houses, but you're taking an inherently weak material, you're cutting it out of its natural repose, and you're putting it on a slope when it's already weak in an uncompacted way, which makes it even more weak and therefore you get things like this, which they obviously saw quite early on in the building of Columbia Parkway and we still see around here. Um, we have a lot of historical quarrying activity for the limestones in our region. We're very limestone rich. Um, and so what they would do is they would quarry, Clifton Avenue is an example of this, for the lime and then dump the shale 
over the edge of the hill, which is exactly what happened with the Compton Avenue slide in 1972. That slide happened in quarrying um, sediments that had been dumped over the edge, so out of their natural context and out of stability from the hillsides that were up here that they were quarrying lime for. So um, that quarrying activity, you can see that's a huge landslide. That's actually known as a rotational slide. It's a little bit different than the kinds of slides that we typically see um, along the way in terms, those are just, um, uh, uh, there's rotational and tr the translation, translational slides, excuse me, are what we think of when we think of Columbia Parkway here. Uh, and then of course we do things like this. We cut the toe of a slope. Uh, we cut the bottom out. This is near the, the Newport Shopping Center. You can see they have a wall for mitigation here. I would be a little bit scared myself, but so goes it. Um, I don't know anything about this wall, particularly how deep it goes into bedrock, but they certainly were thinking about it. But they cut the toe out after the fact. The toe or the bottom of the slope is really what's holding everything else up. And when you cut that out, um, you're creating a very unstable situation. And in fact, that's what happened with the Mount Adams Pier Wall. Uh, they cut out in the 80s to build I-471. They cut out the toe of that slope to make room for the I-471 transition um, to um, I-71 and uh, Mount Washington Way, or Fort Washington Way, excuse me, and, uh, and there was a major landslide as a result of that. So then in went the Mount Adams Pier Wall. So, uh, and also a lot of removal of vegetation has happened. Vegetation isn't going to stop a landslide like the Clifton Avenue slide, but it does really great at holding in the upper layers of colluvium and upper layers of bedrock um, in a translational slide. So if you're thinking about the kinds of things that we have along Columbia Parkway, that's really where vegetation is kind of key uh, in helping to keep um, keeping the upper layers of the, of the rock and the colluvium stable. Of course, vegetation is also critically important because it removes water from the system as plants need to drink. And water in these cases are our enemy. So in Cincinnati, we kind of have this perfect storm for natural disasters um, in terms of landslides and floods and so forth. We have everything we need to make landslides a critical component of our geological activity in this region. We have these inherently weak materials that um, came from our ancient Ordovician seas that were deposited in this region, uh, very clay rich, uh, sediments that form our bedrock that are exposed to natural weathering process thanks to our Pleistocene history of natural glacially carved slope valleys. Then we take that natural system, which would by itself happily give us many landslides, and we increase it by doing our own human activity through construction, through weighing the top of the hill down with infrastructure, houses, pools, all kinds of things, removing the slopes or the toes of slopes to build roads or, or in this case, shopping centers. And we, we mess around with that whole system. We change the direction of water and how it gets out of the system. We urbanize and add concrete to everything, which does not allow for natural permeability of the soils to get water out of the system in a timely fashion. Um, rather, it uh, speeds up that process and introduces water where it doesn't belong very, very quickly, which uh, exacerbates mass movement. And then we live in a, I, I bet you didn't know we live in what's called a humid subtropical climate. Um, that's sort of our climate identification in this part of the region. And that's because we get a lot of gulf moisture coming up, thanks to uh, our pattern of circulation, atmospheric circulation in this region. And we know that we get a lot of rain, particularly in the spring. And like I said, water is our enemy. And so that rain helps to increase the weathering. It helps to introduce water where we don't want it. Um, it helps to expand those clays at the surface. And lo and behold, springtime is the time generally where we get a lot of landslide activity. So we've kind of got this perfect recipe for landslide disaster, which is fantastic if you love landslides, but not so great if you live on a slope or at the bottom of a slope, which is very common here in Cincinnati. 
So landslides um, are, uh, you know, are really a big part of shaping our city. Um, this statistic of uh, eight, eight, 1800 retaining walls is probably outdated given the new activity that has happened on River Road and elsewhere in the city. But you can see, once you recognize what a retaining wall looks like in their various forms, you can see that we have a lot of them holding up our hillsides. Uh, oftentimes we tend to try to bury them um, because they're not the most beautiful things in the world. Uh, one very large, the most expensive at the time uh, retaining wall in the country uh, is indeed the Mount Adams Pier Wall. That was a $30 million wall in the 80s and um, I'm not sure how it stands today, but it certainly is up there as one of the most expensive mitigation structures that we have in the Cincinnati area and maybe even in the United States. And the costs that we bear as a result of our landslides um, are high relative to a lot of uh, other places in the country. Uh, it, at one point we were the highest. Um, I'm not sure that we are today, but what I can say is that even if you haven't been directly affected by a landslide, that is your property or someone you know's property hasn't, hasn't uh, succumbed to a landslide or to um, creep or other things that uh, happen in the area, you certainly are paying for it through your tax dollars. And we've gotten really, really good at trying to mitigate landslides. That is, is that we try to build infrastructure in place that's properly set and studied for the landscape that it's sitting on we put in walls to prevent landslides from happening, but we also still have to do a lot of cleanup. And Columbia Parkway is a, is a wonderful example of that. And um, where it just makes sense to go in and clean things up as, as we go along. So uh, landslides are gonna to be touching our lives for a really long time. Thankfully, most of them for our purposes hit our, our pocketbook and maybe cause some traffic issues every once in a while that are annoying. Uh, for the most part, uh, most of us will not um, see something catastrophic, but we have the potential to do that. So uh, just be aware of your landscape and uh, where you live and keep in mind that this is a natural process that uh, is ongoing and that as humans, we have worked to um, make it more intense but the good news about landslides is that they're one of the only natural disasters that we can actually prevent from happening. Um, so at least on the human time scale. So uh, keep that in mind as we go forward. And with that, I will stop sharing and take any questions. Uh, Brenda, does the type of vegetation matter? You know, you hear about prairie plants having really, really deep roots. So does it matter if it's like, grasses or trees or shrubs? I don't really know. I know that the deeper the roots, the better um, for hanging on to that upper uh, sediment, but I'm not sure if there's something that we should be planting more so than the other. I think I'd have to look into that. Mm. I do know that most of the hillsides just when they're barren are just left to naturally colonize, you know, through succession. So I don't know if there's like a specific plan to say this type of plant has to be planted here. I think it just becomes part of the natural vegetation. That's, that's the way I know it's been treated now. You know, what's really fun about landslides is that you don't need a really big slope to have one. They can be quite dramatic on very small hills. Um, you just need the right conditions. So even if, you, if you're, not that, you know, we want to keep anybody awake at night, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't take much, but um, just be aware of your natural surroundings. Um, I have kind of a tangent quest question, I guess. Um, sure. So obviously we're not in an area that has a high amount of tectonic activity, but the New Madrid Fault obviously comes to mind and some of the firsthand accounts associated with, with that event in the what 1830s I believe if I'm not mistaken are there associated accounts of like major landslides occurring in the area because of that tectonic activity ah interesting I I actually don't know about that particular event I'd have to look and see I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was the case because shaking of already water rich uh, soils can cause liquefaction 
um, which is a common thing that happens in earthquakes that res uh, and, and areas that receive seismic shock. And interestingly, we actually see liquefaction happening in our Ordovician seabeds. So we know that um, even 450 million years ago, that process of seismic shock was affecting even the underwater sediments. But I don't know specifically about those events. Could it happen again? Absolutely, yes. Hmm. Especially in like, I can totally see it sort of in the Mill Creek happening with those glacial lake clays because they're so uh, pure and so rich and, and fine grained that, and um, they sort of act as a seal that traps water, but if that gets shaken up, water gets in and then they expand and liquefy, it, it, it could be, in a big enough so, event, it could happen. Those would be lacustrine clays? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It'd have to be a pretty sizable event though. Liquefaction on that scale usually happens in earthquakes that are of the New Madrid size that we had in the 1830s, like eights and nines. No nines have ever happened here though, but we had eights. So Brenda, on, on the Elberon slides, uh, yeah. the city has just recently uh, done uh, mitigation and they did two things on a 200 foot section about, they put up new retaining walls, which they anchored in the bedrock. I watched them do it. Um, do you know, do you and then know how far down? Uh, it was at least eight or nine or 10 feet. Uh, they were putting um, iron piers in, okay. steel piers into the ground, yeah. and I was watching them drive them. Uh, on the other sections, of course, they don't have money to build walls everywhere. Uh, it seems like what they did was take the vegetation off the slope and then reconfigure the angle of the slope as much as they could. Mm -hmm. But there's only, there's a limit as to what you can do with that. And then they put down little barriers at the bottom to keep slope wars, you know, these little things you see at construction sites. And of course, the first heavy rain, it all came down, pushed a barrier into the street, <laughs> uh, which they, right. they've since cleaned up. So it seems like the walls will fix it if you get rid of the colluvium, but just getting rid of the colluvium when you still have steep angled slopes doesn't seem to buy you much time. Right, so you'll see that there's, I think their tactic is dependent on the angle of the slope, like the where they built the wall and put the pier in up at the top. I mean, that's a really high angled slope. Further down, if I'm get, gauging where you're saying, it's kind of a little bit more of a, of a shallower slope. Um, you can see that they've used both tactics sort of at Columbia Parkway as well, um, where they've taken sections where they scraped the colluvium off um, and basically exposed it sort of close to bedrock. And that will give you some time, like I said, maybe about 80 years before you have to worry about that section again, because it takes that long for the natural weathering process. But other higher angles, what they've done is they've bolted the, the rock wall itself and put netting on top. And then that will allow vegetation to grow on top of that. So I think their tactics really and I'd have to talk to the to my friend in the engineering division about it, but I think their tactics relate to, you know, first of all, what's most cost effective, obviously, uh, what's what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, and probably also um, on a case by case basis, what the angle of that slope is and what's the best mitigation measure. Sometimes just scraping it is the best way to go for not a permanent solution, but a long term cost effective solution, and that's sort of what they're choosing to do in a lot of places. But that's expensive, but it's not as expensive as sinking piers. So Brenda, how much of this has to do, you haven't really mentioned a lot about climate change and increased rainfall. If these, yeah. if these roads like Columbia Parkway seem to be fairly stable for a long time and Elbron, most of it never had walls until the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, is there some sort of connection going on between um, global climate change, increased rainfall that's that's exacerbating the problem? Well, I think that um, it's a two-part thing. First of all, it's the natural process of accumulation of sediment over time or colluvium over time. And that you, you hit a tipping point, right? Where there's enough of a buildup on a slope that's high. And when you hit that tipping point, you're gonna see more events happening. So that's what's happening like an Albron and Columbia Parkway is that that colluvium is built up to a certain thickness over the last 80, 90 years to the critical tipping point where now it's no longer able to hang on and it's failing. But also we do know 
that um, climate change and our increased uh, temperatures is going to bring more moisture into the regions of the Gulf of Mexico. We're going to have more major storms, more frequently, bigger. Um, that increase in water will also uh, increase our landslide activity. So one of the consequences of climate change, certainly for our region amongst many others, is going to be an increase in mass movements that we're going to see. If anyone's interested in the manuscript collection, there is a first-hand account of the, was it the Madrid earthquake in 1830s um, mm -hmm. by James McBride, and he describes uh, uh, like brimstone, and I think the river changed direction, something. Um, anyway, it's... Oh, okay. We do know that that the, that there is sections um, of the river, of a river. Cha I'd have to look at it changing direction, but not. I never heard of it in Cincinnati. It it happened in New Madrid or that region out of Missouri. But the exact details I'm not familiar with. You know, that I'm not sure what it was. Maybe he was out there. I don't know, but he, yeah, it, it probably would have been more out there than out here. I mean, we had some big earthquakes out here, but nothing like what they had over there. The New Madrid is, a, is an old rift scar. It's a scar in the basement of North America where we were splitting in half at one point in time, but failed the split. Um, and we have a lot of these, it's kind of like an old wound in the basement of our continent. In fact, continents have a lot of these old wounds that, um, you know, as continents come together and break apart and come together, some some rifts where they're beginning to split are successful and you get things like, you know, South America away from Africa, but then some of them start and then the split goes somewhere else and they fail, but they leave a weak zone in the crust. It's a thinner zone in our basement rock. We have quite a few rifts, the New Madrid being one of the biggest ones, um, that get activated every once in a while just from general tectonic pressures as the continent moves relative to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, because we are moving and those pressures build and then every once in a while you just get that ache, you know, in that old scar and you get an earthquake in the middle of the continent. We call these intracontinental uh, earthquakes. They're more rare than ones that happen at plate boundaries or at the boundaries of continents where two plates collide like on the west coast. But they're just activated by these tectonic pressures every once in a while and you get something like an earthquake here. It's fascinating. Our geologic history is fascinating. <laughs> and terrifying. <laughs> and terrifying. Well, knowledge is power in my mind, you know, so. It's random, too random for me. But <laughs> uh, I think I have one more question that sure. kind of piggybacks on Bob's. Um, so with obvious climate change, the content, the acidic content of rain can change. Um, and we're seeing obviously more acid rain in certain parts of the country where there's industrial activity. Would that expedite potentially the, mm. the, the dissolution of the colluvium or increase its, its, its rate of uh, growth? Interesting. I've never linked those in my brain. Sorry, Todd, I'm not, I'm not giving you many answers <laughs> today. Um, I can't <laughs> see that it's going to help the situation from an educated guess. Actually, acid rain is declining quite a bit or it has declined um, due to pollution controls in the past couple decades. There you go. Well, that's yeah, good news. That's good news. I can't see that it would help the situation any, but I don't know if it's gonna increase, like if, if that unnatural sort of system increases chemical weathering that we see. The clays are already pretty inert in the mm -hmm. sense that they are the products of a lot of weathering, but I don't know if, if that's gonna increase the shedding or I mean like the, the expansion rate or anything like that of clays that we have. So I, I actually have to take a look and do some research on that, but I think I will yeah, do that. It's interesting. It necessarily just have to be like acid rain either. I mean, with just runoff from you yes. know, agriculture or animal husbandry or anything, all of that would have some kind of effect, especially as water's percolating down through the right the, the, the hilltops to the, the, the water table. One of the things that we do and we do really well is we take natural drainage systems and then we mess them up according to our needs. Yeah. We divert water in places that it didn't go before. So the system is not, not capable of handling it. We don't allow it to percolate and permeate through our soils at a rate that the system can handle before it gets to the river. And we mess all of those things up, whether it's by 
using uh, urbanization and concrete or, um, you know, changing drainage patterns because we don't want our basements flooded or putting pools and other things where they shouldn't be and stuff like that. We mess all of that up and that affects um, the landscape. So yeah, it's very important. Well, great job. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah, thanks everybody. I hope you're all doing well. It's good to see everyone. See you. Yeah. We're surviving. <laughs> Enjoyed learning about landslides. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> I enjoyed teaching about landslides. I guess I have to get out there and see what, what's new in the, in the general hot spots that we have in Cincinnati and then also see if anything else is happening. Mm. Um, that is not uh, what we typically see. So good times. Okay, everybody, take care. Good job. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>